uh, used firearms. Sometimes you get a great buy and sometimes you get a lemon. And today we might just have someone here who's got himself a lemon. Let's stay tuned and see if we can't find out how to buy a used rifle online sight unseen this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors. Hi everyone, Ron Spomer here with my good friend Steve who has got an object lesson for us on the table. This is a classic Model 70 Winchester from the middle of the 20th century. This was the rifleman's rifle, the number one considered to be American-made bolt-action rifle, and the 300 Magnum was the Magnum of the day. If you didn't have a 300 Win Mag or, well, there were some Weatherby Mags out, but for the common man, I think the 300 H&H &H was the big deal, and Steve had kind of always wanted one for the, I guess, the nostalgic appeal. It is. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, Steve, what was, was the situation with this rifle? You bought it online? I did. I, I bought it on the internet. <clears throat> um and, you know, I'd been searching for well over a year. Um, I just have a soft spot in my heart for the Model 70s. Uh, it was a, I bought my dad one uh, when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and ever since then, I've just had this emotional attachment to the Model 70, let alone the fact that it's a great rifle and the, the way it's built and everything. Uh, but I've, I felt like, you know, I had a 375 H&H, &H, and I just felt like that the 300 H&H &H was a classic addition to okay. that to complement each other, yeah. right? All right. Both Africa, geared towards Africa. All right. Uh, belted Magnum, same, yeah. you know, same chambering, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it was <clears throat> it was something that I, I again, I, I, I really didn't need it, but boy, did I want one. <laughs> and so... I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked, and I came across this this weapon right here. And this is one of those online legit selling sites. Very much so. It's they go through your FFL dealers and all oh, the rest, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yes, it's all on board. I mean, it, there's there's no margin for error with them because mm -hmm. they they obviously have a lot at stake. Okay, so you pretty much knew that the seller online, this this company, I don't want to name them, but whatever the gun broker was online, you knew that they were trustworthy. Now you're dealing with an individual. Yes. Yeah, he. This was a private sale, okay. uh, and in the in the description, it'll tell you all the f the features of the gun, but it'll also mm -hmm. tell you whether it's a company uh, business uh, or whether it's an individual private sale. And okay. this happened to be a private sale guy. Okay, as an older gentleman, um, and uh, just was getting too old to hunt. <clears throat> and okay. decided to sell. So here's what I, my question is. If if you're buying online, what do you ask about it? When when I'm in a shop or something, I can see the gun and I can make some assessments. What do you do when you've got a guy on a phone who may be living four states away? Right. Great question. I What I had, what I did was I, I had a, <clears throat> a piece of uh, tablet paper and I just sat down and wrote myself a list of things to ask. Okay, good Important idea. Important key components mm -hmm. to what if. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it started out basically with the question, the simple question is, why are you selling it? Okay. There and has to be a reason. Why you sell it, number yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and then it, it went from there. It's like, what is your personal experience with it? How much okay. have you used it? And so on. And you just, I just went right down the list. Now, of course, the guy could always be blowing smoke. He could. He, he very well so could. So are you assessing the way he's responding? I, I did. I did. I You know, whether there are pauses or hesitations or whether he was, I, I felt like that I, you know, I would get part of a sentence and not the rest of it, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. And then I hung up and I called him back. I waited a few days and called him back again. Any strategy to and, that? And, yes. And to see if the answers changed. Ah. So to see smart. if, if his... You know, the way that he, <clears throat> there's a lot in the way that someone answers a question. Mm -hmm. And it, when you can't see someone and it's all verbal communication, mm -hmm. um, you're listening for things like voice inflections and that kind of stuff. Sure. And that may be a little bit more than what most people do, uh -huh. but I, I don't have the money to just go buy any gun I want. Right. You so know, you this gotta, is, yeah, yeah, I got to be smart. I got to use, uh, yeah, I got to, I got to use common sense okay. and I got to be smart about it. All right. It. So you're psychologically more or less assessing this guy exactly. and judging whether he's trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. What else do you ask about the rifle? Like, you know, is the stock broken or is the barrel bent? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it in a loop on the end? Those kinds <laughs> of things. 
I, you know, essentially <clears throat> you're looking at photographs uh -huh. and, and so one of the things that I do is I'll, I'll take a particular photograph and I'll ask him a question relegated to that specific photograph. Okay. So for example, it looks like there's a worn spot on the barrel mm -hmm. in front of the, the, you know, the forehand. Okay. Uh, you know, tell me about that. Is, is, right. is it pitted? Is it, is it, did you, have you had to work on it? Is it, was that from like being in a rifle scabbard? What, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. And if they don't have, I don't know, it's just always been there then. Oh, so you bought the gun from someone else. Ah, So you're getting a little more history. So, yeah. So, so you work yourself into these questions and it's, it's, you, you have to, you have to have a basic outline that you're following. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the intuition of how to ask the question in a way that you feel like you're going to get the most information, which what's the condition of the bore? You know, what's the condition of the, of the metal overall? What percentage blue would you say it is? Mm -hmm. uh, like the stock in this particular instance, I, I could see the finish was worn really bad in several places. I could also see in the photographs that that looked like that there were dents. And so I asked him, I said, I said, okay, tell me about that dent that's in front of the, the recoil. So you pad. really got specific. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, I said, what, tell me about that dent that's in front of the, is it a cut or is it a dent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause you can steam a dent out, but you have to repair a cut. Now, were you prepared to do some work on the stock? I was planning like on it. I was, oh, I was okay. planning, I was planning on, because when I saw the photographs of the stock, I was planning on refinishing it. My primary concern in that, Ron, was, was the extent of the, 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 the penetrations into the wood and the condition of the checkering. Now, as you can see, and it would be really hard for viewers to see, but the checkering is intact. Mm -hmm. The border lines are there. They're not interrupted. There's the, none of the, none of the checkering is damaged beyond just normal wear. And I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. It's a 70 plus year old gun. Yeah. 19, yeah. A little well, bit flat, 1953. Yeah. No gouges in no, it or anything. None. It's yeah. All there. And so I can live with that. And, yeah. you know, um, I've had rifles with brand new checkering that when you shoot them, and particularly in these larger calibers, you know, your fingers are going like, oh my gosh, what are you doing to me? Right. Yeah. I've asked him about the bottom metal because there, you know, I don't remember there being a really good picture of the bottom metal. So I asked him about that. Mm -hmm. I asked him about, um, <clears throat> There was a scope on there, so I got some details on the scope. I determined after I'd hung up that I didn't want that particular scope, that okay. I had. I would rather do my own thing there, mm -hmm. but I wanted the bases and the rings. Um, you know, so you're just making like, okay, if I do this, then this is what I'm willing to accept. Okay. And so I, I went into a, a great amount of detail. Probably the single most important question is, how long have you had this gun? Did you hunt with it? Okay. Or was it a target gun? Uh, I mean, what were you doing? Were you just, yeah. was it just for fun or has it just been, it was some uncle that, and you've never used it. What, what's the answer to that question? So what about um, asking how many rounds have been put through it? Is it worth even asking? Because well, it's so easy to not tell he, the truth. Well, he said, he, he said, he said, I really don't remember. He said, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't been able to hunt for at least or shoot this gun for at least two years. And so I, I honestly can't tell you how many times I, I shot it. Uh, and, and he said, I just, you know, I've had it a long time. I just don't remember. So you're sort of buying a pig in a poke when it comes to how many <clears throat> rounds have gone yep, down yep, the barrel. Yep, yep, yep. And then you just have to assume, all right, what's an average hunter? You're probably not doing target shooting with a sporter weight rifle and a 300 Magnum. No. So that, it's probably that, only hunting. Yeah. How much hunting can one man do in a lifetime? Right. And he's, he was in Oregon. And with the restrictions that they have on tags there, he was only getting a tag about every three or four years. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so so I'm thinking, okay, so you're hunting elk with this primarily. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> how, he said, I just would go out and check the check the zero on my scope. And as long, because I, you know, I, yeah. as long as it was... Still on. Still on. Shoot. I'm not going to waste ammunition doing that. Okay. And and so, plus he said it hurts when it shoots. Okay. Now, <laughs> so, <laughs> hurts when I shoot. That's good to know. <laughs> Something to expect. Do you get some kind of a guarantee from this gentleman? Um, <clears throat> Ron, to be honest with you, the the guarantee is a, is a personal guarantee. You have when you buy it, and in most of the situations that I've studied, is, is that when the gun comes in to whomever it's shipped to, in my case as an FFL dealer, uh, I had them shipped to there and, and um, I'd used them before on mm -hmm. at least two other rifles and, I and th they were really good about it. Um, and so it comes in, you look at it, <clears throat> 
technically, if you walk out the door with the gun, you own it. There is no return. So it's not like you can go home and test it for groups or anything. You cannot fire it. You can't take it apart. You only examine it at the dealer. And if you say, no, this gun is not what it was advertised, I don't. I sent one back. You do send one back. I I had a 375 HH that I bought from a broker. So that's good. And I sent, I looked, I took one look at it and I said, this ain't going to fly. And I packed, put it back up, taped it up. So you got your money back. No problem. Paid them to ship it. And yeah. And I called them and told them I'm shipping it back. All right. Now, you've bought this gun. He comes in. You're at the dealer. You look it over. You go, Mr. Paul. As advertised. Pretty close. I think I can live with it. Except for one thing. Okay, what? The stock. Ah, what was wrong with the stock? <clears throat> it it was, and when I put it up, I went, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Something's not right here because my, my th- th- nose is almost on my thumb. Short length of pull. <clears throat> Sa- short length of pull. So the, the stock, stock had been cut too far. Mm-hmm. And so the standard length of pull on these rifles is, you know, depending on who you talk to, is 13 and 5 eighths inches. And this was under 13. Yeah. So I'm, I did deal. measure that. So I'm sitting there looking at it going like, can I live with this? Yep. And you and decided I talked you could. myself into it. I yeah, talked okay. talk okay. myself into it. You figured yeah. you could put a longer recoil pad on yeah, it or yeah. something? Yeah. So what we wound up doing was a spacer. Uh, a, yep. See that. A, a spacer. And, yeah, and then, right and then a, a one inch recoil pad. So we got inch and a half worth of stock extension and you don't love it do you no i don't i don't like the look it just it's it distracts from it's almost two inches isn't it so that's one of those that's one of those deals where when you fall in love with something and you fall in love with the idea you lose perspective Mm -hmm. and this is one of those where i honestly hands up here i lost perspective i mean i just i i looked at it and went well Five eighths of an inch is not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not the end of the world, but, but you don't, you don't find a 300 Magnum model 70 middle of the 20th century classic rifle like this everywhere. You've been looking for, for years. Yeah. You finally find it. So you're not real eager to turn it back. You figure you can make it work. And for the price. Uh huh. I mean, here again, you got a good price. I got a good price on it. I got, you know, I talked him down a little bit and. I felt like I'd negotiated pretty well, that I'd asked all the right questions, but I did not ask the question, has the stock been modified? So, so that's what you found out after. Uh, so, yeah. so now you've refinished it. Yep. You've extended it. You're not crazy about the look, but it's, it's a good right length of pull. Stock feels right. It's functional. Yep. Anything else wrong with the stock? <laughs> well, <clears throat> when I took the stock off to refinish it, I discovered that it had been glass bedded. And it's not just the action. But the entire length of the barrel, full which, length bedded, full length bedded. That's, which, that's not good with you. Not well. I wasn't crazy about it, but knowing that they did that a lot, mm-hmm. and that that was, oh yeah, I see it of the period. Um, you know, you just again, I just I went uh, okay. As long as it shoots well, I can live with it. So you're not buying a collector's piece here. You no, I'm buying a shooter. Original. No, no, no. I'm buying a shooter, straight okay. up shooter. All right. I want to hunt with the dog. So that's not that big of a deal. No. That suggests no. to me that the guy said this is not accurate enough, and he fixed it at some and point. It probably yeah. is at okay. some point. Yeah. So now you're going to go out and shoot it to see how accurate it really is. Yep. What happens? Can't close the bolt. What? Can't close the bolt. Cannot close. Cannot the bolt. Cannot close the bolt. I've got hand loads in there, <clears throat> and of course I'm freaking out thinking. That I that my reloads are wrong, and so got my calipers out and I measured it. I put, looked it up in the reloading manual, and I yeah. went, "I'm under." And what I had done was I had 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 set the length, the overall length, so that the rounds would feed correctly. Um, so they're fitting and, into the magazine, yeah, with the bolt out. I've got the, the bolt, bolt out, out just safely and playing safe, with safely house, playing but. with it, looking at. And you can once you've done it enough, you can look down in the magazine from on top. And sure. You go, okay, I've got clearance to yep. get it up and yeah. per, controlled round feed. It's going to go right up in chamber. It's going to be perfect. So I built a bunch of test loads, uh, five different test loads, oh. and and um, I go to the range and uh, go to chamber the round. I can't close the bolt. And so I'm thinking, what did I do? What did I what do did, wrong? What did huh? I do wrong? And exactly, I'm looking at myself going like, what kind of a mistake did you make? So what was it? Well, so what it turned out to be was a headspace. So the distance from, <clears throat> from the, the bolt face to the, the recess for the belt on the cartridge mm-hmm. was too, too yeah, short. Too, yeah, it, it just, it wouldn't, it, close. It, it wouldn't close. Well, how did the previous owner ever shoot it? Great question. So I, 
I, that night I called the guy and I said, <clears throat> I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but you know, I, I told him, I said, tell me again about the, I, I've got some more questions about your rifle. He goes, well, how are you getting along with it? I said, well, not very well. And he goes, you don't like it? And I said, that doesn't do anything like it. <laughs> it's not I like can't it. use it. <laughs> you can't use it. And he said, what do you mean you can't use it? I said, I can't close the bolt. He goes, what kind of ammunition are you using in there? I said, they're hand loads and they're under Sammy specs. And I can't, I can't get the bolt closed. I said, when did you shoot this last? He said, I shot it within the last couple of years. I took it hunting. I shot with it. And I said, you couldn't have. There's no way. Because the bolt won't close. Because the bolt won't close. Now, did you try other loads, other ammo? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And it's tried you, factory ammunition. Took one factory, it, the, it won't even close the factory. No, so the guy's no. been lying to you. Well, uh, I'm not going to. I don't think he did it intentionally because he had multiple rifles. He had multiple 300 H&Hs. What? And so he thinks that he sent me the wrong rifle. What? This is getting <laughs> crazier and yeah, crazier. So. So yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a story. I mean, the guy was, the guy was humiliated by the whole thing. I mean, yeah. the guy, honestly, he was just like, I can't believe what, I, you know, how that. This Did he offer stumbled. to take it back? Yeah, what back? he didn't, he, he said, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think I talked to the gunsmith and he says, he thinks he can ream it out and we'll be fine. Okay. So he's just going <clears> to <throat> fix the just, headspace. Yeah, just fix the headspace issue. Okay. And and the the gunsmith said, oh yeah, most of the time it's you know it's like five thousandths and and you know we'll just we'll just Tweet set it, it up. He said, I'll just keep working on it until tweaks. Well, it turns out it wasn't five thousandths; it was one hundred and twenty five thousandths. So it's like an eighth of an inch. Holy! So how did so this and the gunsmith the gunsmith is freaking out because he's thinking he's going to ruin the gun. Yeah. And and so excessive. Yeah. Space. So. So the guy, but the guy that sold the gun offered to pay to have it fixed. Okay. And so at that point, rather than because, and here's, again, I'd already invested in, you know, refinishing it. I, you know, I got the, the, the mm -hmm. recoil pad on there. Uh, you know, I'd done some other things. Um, but it just was like, I was just sitting there going like, what do I do? I mean, I honestly was sitting there debating with myself. So I called the gunsmith the next morning and I said, what, what should we do? He said, I can, I'll, I'll fix it. Hey, he's he a gunsmith. Said, I, I'm a gunsmith. I can, he said, I, said, I do this all the time. Yeah. Yeah. How complicated can it be? So what happened? <laughs> well, so he reamed it out. He took it out and the gunsmith actually took it out and shot it himself. What, did, what kind of group did he get? Less uh, sub MOA. Four shots, random That's loads, nice. random loads, not the same load, not the same case, not the same bullet, random loads. They're all 300 H&H &H factory Just to see loads, if they would work. To see if they would work. And the they end up shooting sub MOA. Sub MOA. The first two shots, he said the bolt was sticky. Sticky, okay. Sticky. Was it exact words? Mm -hmm. um, he's Australian. And so <clears throat> he had some other words in there, but yeah, that'll we'll work. We'll get the Yeah, we'll get that. So anyway, so he said after the first two, he said it loosened up a little bit. And he said, he said, I didn't do a good enough job of cleaning it after I reamed it out. And he said, I just figured that there was some debris in there and didn't worry about it. So <clears throat> I said, okay. He said, why don't you take it and go shoot it? And he said, try your reloads in there and, and go shoot it. All so right. I. Now you're off to shoot it and now, what happens? I can't open the bolt. You I can't, I cannot open the bolt. Did at, you fire it? Did I fired it. It went off. Oh you gosh. I mean, it in. loaded. Per, I mean, it's like glass going in there. Okay. I mean, it loaded perfectly. There was no resistance whatsoever. So I'm at a hundred door, hundred yard indoor range. I take the first shot and I thought, <clears throat> wow, that's, you know, for just having it, you know, just sighted, not even sighted in on paper or anything. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like an inch high and a half inch left or right. Okay. I thought that's, that's so really now good. You, you got a good shot. So you now I so, so I'm so I go to lift the bolt and I can't open the bolt. It won't even lift up. I, no, I in fact it's healed now, but I tore the thumb off of my trying to do it two handed to open it. And you tore your thumb <laughs> off like this? <laughs> well, I, yeah, well, maybe not that. We're not going to go there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. But anyway, so so I'm looking at it going like, what the heck? And again, my first thought is, what did you do wrong? Did you overload that case? That, that's my first thought. Is, and I went, no, because these are minimum. 
So you my maximum, no, I didn't start at the top. I safety first, man. Yeah, yeah. Start at the bottom, work your way up. So you've got a starting load well yep. under the pressure limit. Well, well under. But you you can't even get the case out to look at it. No. Okay. And so so I finally got it open and looked at it, and the 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 neck of the case was slightly distorted, and the shoulder where the neck intersects the shoulder, the 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 toe of the shoulder. There was a the case was separated in a semicircle. Separated. Separate. Yeah, it had a complete break all the way through. Was was part of the case still up in the? No, chamber? it was it was there, but it only went Came halfway. Out. Yeah, the neck was only so split halfway around. Halfway split in a concentric. Yeah, not lengthwise. No, not lengthwise. That is weird. So I I looked I looked at the head. I looked at the belt. I looked at the the primer pocket. Yeah. And then I I'm I'm just looking at it going like what. What in the world am I doing? You weren't reading 300 <clears throat> Weatherby Magnum data for this cartridge, no, were you? <laughs> no, 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 no. In so, fact, I've got a friend of mine that I, I mean, I, I load for his, his 300 Winchester Magnum, and I was using seven more grains of powder in that than I was in this load. Yeah. So there's so no, there is light. no way, and that was intentional. I mean, <clears throat> it was like. The first, my first thought, you know, in doing these really light loads is two things. First of which is to get used to the rifle itself and, and you know, the trigger pull, because I had the trigger worked on and get the, the trigger pull, you know, and, and, and the recoil. And am I, am I, is it recoiling straight back or do I have muzzle jump? Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of things and getting used to it and then fouling the barrel. Because fouling the barrel? The foul, yeah, because I wanted to foul the barrel before I got to my real test loads because it was supposed to be really clean well oh, the gunsmith had cleaned yeah, it yeah okay and well we're gonna find out about that too so well it feels good i like this the slim stock on this i'm kind of surprised i've always had the feeling that these rifles from the mid 20th century were a little bit bulkier than stock than they are these days but this one sure isn't this no is it's sweet. not at all in fact it it <clears throat> it fits me it fits me as well as any gun that i've got so um, I was really looking forward to being able to, you know, take it to Africa and, and use so it. So what stage is it in now? Are you still, is this well, just happened with that the, just happened, just happened. Uh, I took it back to the gunsmith, um, on Friday of last week and, um, he had a family situation that came up and he wasn't able to work on it. So I drove over and picked it up. He's closed on Thursday, so I drove over and picked it up, and so I'd have it to do. This okay, today. so this is so exactly as it was when you shot identical. it. Identical, yeah. Nothing has changed. So then it gets more interesting. But you need that. to go. There's more stuff. Well, I mean, we can talk about that, but yeah, there's. there's okay, so <laughs> as it sits now, if you're if we're advising anyone on buying a used rifle, <laughs> beware. One yeah. buyer, beware. Get some kind of a guarantee from this guy you're buying it from in case something like weird Ab like this absolutely. happens. Absolutely. And then, and if you can you get it in writing, obviously that's that's the that's yeah. the ultimate goal. Is anything you do, um, <clears throat> like getting a receipt for paying for it. Yes. I mean that's yes. something yes. that people don't even think about. But getting a receipt for it, getting some kind of a, a assurance, in, in, whether it's an email or whatever it is, print it out. Yeah. And I have a file folder on every single rifle I have with all the communication in it. And and I go back to it mm -hmm. as a reference. Mm -hmm. Like what what did I ask differently then that I didn't ask wow, this you're time? You're keeping some nicely detailed records. Yeah, That's great. Yeah, because for for good reason. Yeah, right? obviously, yeah. obviously. <clears throat> but before we get to the solution on this, and we may not get to it until next week or something. But I, I think what we really need to be telling folks is all of this stuff is like ask all these questions plus. Yeah. When you initially get that rifle in at your FFL dealer, wherever it's shipped to, and you still have the right to send it back and get your money back, if there's some little piece you don't like, bid or think pretty darn yeah, hard about. You got to, because you're, you're, it's, <clears throat> like for me, it's a lifetime thing. It's not like I buy and sell. These are, my son's going to get these. Yeah. Okay. You, you want it for so, your collection. Yeah. So, um, a couple of things about the actual, <clears throat> the purchase part. I, I, the two questions I didn't ask are, uh, you know, about the bore itself in enough detail. Uh, I didn't ask enough about, has the stock been modified? Now yeah, I could see, and again, obvious. that was me operating assumption, looking at photographs, yeah. or good photographs, looking at it going, okay, it's got an aftermarket recoil pad on it. I'm going to put a recoil pad on it anyway, so it doesn't matter. I don't care. Yeah, I'm going to refinish it anyway. So you should have asked him, what is the length of pull? Yes, I should have. I yeah. would have said, what's the trigger pull weight? 
Now, a lot of guys don't know that, but some do. And you would think, I well, asked him, he didn't know. He didn't know. He did okay. not know. So. See, your, your average shooter, especially an older gentleman who's lived and hunted in the 60s, 70s and stuff, he may not. We didn't do that back in those days. You had yeah. a gun at work, you went hunting. Yeah. So uh, anything else you should have asked him? Did you stock glass bed the stock? Yeah. Or it, what, or what other, like were there any stock modifications, okay. which any leaves kind. it open? Any kind of stock modifications. Yeah. Did you have the, like, did you have a checkering done? Have you ever refinished it? Yep. Have you... <clears throat> You know, have you opened up the barrel channel because it's, you know, like I had a, a one that I had to open up the barrel channel on because the, the wood was pressing against the yeah. barrel. So, um, you know, those all of those kinds of questions are, are paramount questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second tier to that is that when you actually the, the actual physical inspection of the gun, unless there's something that just like, oh, my gosh, the barrel's been painted. Mm hmm which I got one that the barrel had been painted. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I so it. I just put it back in the box and sent it away. But but looking at it with a bore light versus a bore scope. Oh, you Which we did. <clears throat> we did at the at the FF. I took and I looked at it because of the way it was. You know, it's just that little short deal. I just stuck it in the barrel and I and I looked up in the barrel and it looked fine. Yeah, you can't tell much from that. You no, you can't. So like that, that was lesson number 13 on this deal. <laughs> this is what I always say is this bore scope. The Hawkeye bore scope has been around for a long time and this is a high quality professional bore scope. It is not inexpensive, but most gunsmiths should have one. And man, can you tell a lot with this? If you're buying a used rifle, you can see the outsides and all the other things, but right. what do you know about the bore? And as you found out with the gunsmith you're working with, he didn't have one of these, right? He has a camera. Uh, it's a computer-operated camera. Okay. That's... But he hadn't used it yet. Ah, he okay. hadn't run it down there yet because mm -hmm. of the family issues. So what we can do with this, of course, is look down the bore and get a highly magnified view of the bore condition. Right. And, but, and I don't know if we can figure out in the chamber what's giving you all these problems with. <laughs> that's crazy. But if you have an opportunity to use something like this and you're buying used guns, use one of these and see if you can see any obvious problems. So when I look down this bore, uh, I am seeing some kind of a strange ring in there full of carbon. Very slim, narrow little crack, uniform, going at the circumference of... It looks like it's right. It might be where the neck of the case stops, so the start of the throat. So the throat is a little area in front where the bullet would be sitting, and then it's going to ramp up into the rifling. So let's see if I slide forward, if I can find the rifling. Uh, oh, my goodness. That rifling? Steve, I am seeing lots of alligator cracking. That's a sign of heat cracking yep. in an older barrel. Kind of expect that. This is how barrels get shot out. It looks like alligator hide or a broken up old sidewalk. Not real deep, but a lot of it. But the thing is, I'm not finding the rifling. Uh, it's hard to find. There it is. Let me slide forward. Okay, now it's sharpening up. All right, this is classic stuff. Really dirty. Um, nah, I don't know if it's... Ex Did you say that your gunsmith shot it and got... <coughs> Yep. MOA loop? Yeah, he did. Wow. And uh, one of the things that he said, mentioned to me was is that um, he should have done a better job of cleaning that out because, you know, with the machining oil and the filings and all that kind of stuff, that, that he was just in a hurry to go shoot it. And he thought, well, I'll just clean it after I shoot it. When in reality, it should have been cleaned better before he shot it. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's again hindsight type thing but that's the most inf that's all the information i have at this point up until you looking at that right there so what i'm seeing is uh it's pretty smooth from the throat into the start of the rifling that rifling has been worn down a lot and it's rounded where it was you normally a sharp edge and i have to go quite a ways forward before i'm starting to see the sharp edge of the lands cutting down into the valleys mm -hmm. into the grooves but if it's shooting moa who cares right i as long, as long as the barrel is stable and regardless of, of you know, the, the, those conditions, if they're not fatal to the barrel and it shoots well, mm -hmm. then that's one of those decisions that, that I can, I, again, I can live with because I'm not going to be shooting a thousand rounds out of this thing. So how about this? When you're buying a gun from somebody, you're saying, how well does it shoot? 
Oh, it, it shoots like a house of fire. Well, what's your definition of a house of fire? I did, I, that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> okay. He said, oh, it shoots great. I said, okay, let's give me a definition of great. <laughs> well, I kill things I shoot at. I said, that's not, it's not quite what I had in mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was, I was thinking more like if you've got a target at 100 yards, there you go. what kind of a repeatable pattern do you have when the bullet strikes the paper? Yeah. That's more of my definition of... Could he provide any of yeah, that? For yeah, he you? said, oh, yeah, it? he said, it's, it shoots. He said, the last time I shot it, of course, was a couple of years ago, but he said, it shoots an inch and a half groups with factory loads, something like that. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, maximum point blank range, what can I live with? Yeah. You know, that's the first thought that came to my mind. Was yeah, maximum, that's a good one, too. Yeah. You know, what can I live with? What are you expecting to hunt it's at? Just, well, yeah, is, yeah, what, what's yeah, your maximum what, range? Well, this is, I'm, I'm looking at under 300 yards. Oh, shoot. Yeah. One and yeah. a half is plenty good. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so again, I'm being in love with the project versus maintaining that objectivity mm -hmm. is a huge issue when it comes to be buying these things, because it's, it's like falling in love with a house. And you you're not you see that there's no kitchen sink. Good bones. It's got good bones. <laughs> yeah. I, think I, can I mean, fix you it. know, but how much are you willing to spend? Yeah. In order to get it to where you're happy so, with it. So Steve, it sounds to me like this is more of a project for you. It is. It's ongoing. You're not trying to buy a great rifle that's all ready to go. You kind of want to expect to do a little bit of work Some, on yeah, it. Yeah, and I enjoy it. I mean, I don't okay. I don't mind the work. In yep. fact, I it's it to me it's uh it's very relaxing and it's, it's enjoyable for me to do. It gives me a project. Especially, yeah. Well, I can see know. that from the finish. You know, when I first grabbed this thing, I thought, man, that stock is like pristine, but you've refinished it. I tried to put it back to looking like it's just coming off the shelf. Yeah. You know, uh, it, that is a good, good look. Okay. So it's your project rifle. You're going to continue to work on it then, right? Well, my next step, Ron, to be just blunt about it is what you put, throw it back at the gunsmith and say, okay, this is what we found. What do you, what can you do about it? So, yeah, if he's already worked on it, got the headspace right, used his no-go gauge and stuff and got the yeah. headspace right. Yeah. This still has the question, how did the previous owner get it to shoot? Well, uh, he couldn't. He couldn't. I mean, there's no way. So that's so why. Did he send you the wrong bolt for it? Well, no, because the, on Model 70s, the, the serial number's inscribed on the bolt right. and on the receiver. And they're the same. And they're identical. That's the first thing I looked at was do they, I asked, that was one of the questions on the list. Does the serial number on the bolt match the, the receiver? Mm -hmm. That's, that was like number four on my list of okay. questions. And that was the right yeah, answer. Yeah, because, it, it because the headspace is such a, such a tedious issue with regard to these things because there's so much handwork in them. That's why Winchester inscribed them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that you didn't get the wrong bolt in the wrong receiver. Yeah, I was with a guy hunting once, and he had done that. He'd got he had a couple of, I think they were Winchesters, or they were a controlled on feed act. It might have been Montana ninety nines or something. But he got two twin rifles, one a different caliber kind of a deal, and he got the bolts mixed up. Fortunately, Oops. they were right there in camp, and it was like, why isn't this rifle working? And I said, mm, "Did you try this bolt instead?" <laughs> and bingo, <laughs> yeah. he's back. So in anyway, goodness. so work in progress. Going back to the gunsmith. Yep. And I'll just have to give you an update. All right. So let's let's do this, Steve. I want to know what happens with this. Maybe we could do a video of shooting it. That folks, we're going to try to do this. We're going to uh, get this to the gunsmith. See what he says. Right. See if we can't get it shooting. But I think I want to be involved in this thing. I want to go out on the range and film you shooting it. Okay. You know, just in case yeah. your fingers come off the bottom in several pieces or something like that. Right, right. <laughs> I think well, it'll help the arthritis. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> it'll fix something. Yeah. Um, but it's got potential. You think it it's does? Got I think it, I think it has potential. If we can solve, if we can solve the throat forward mm -hmm. or the you know the neck component forward, solve that issue, then I think I think we'll be okay. Yeah, and it'll be yeah. fun to see if. If you truly did shoot a good group with it, using factory ammo and mixed ammo and everything, and you work up some hand loads, did you see how well it shoots with that fairly rough looking barrel? Yeah. I mean, to me, like that barrel has had a few rounds through it, folks. Well, it could be because because uh, these were used early on as as target rifles, you know, in world championships and stuff. The yeah, three hundred H and H thousand yard. Yeah, it was a thousand yard, yard winner back in yep. the day. Yeah, yep. it was pretty yep. hot so, stuff. Anyway. But this just isn't the right platform for a target. I can't yep. imagine any target shot. But maybe he was just kind of an amateur enjoying himself, could be. Could doing be. a bunch of shooting. Could be. At any rate, I think we do have a nice, a fun little project. So, buyer beware. 
Let's sum this up real quick. When you're looking uh, online and buying a rifle, look at all the photos, ask for more photos, see what the bluing looks like and the stock condition and all, and it kind of make a rough decision there. Get in writing that this guy is guaranteeing, blah, blah, blah. If you want, ask about what kind of groups it shoots, the trigger pull, the length of pull. Yep. Has the barrel been full length bedded or floated or any other modifications like that? Um, and again, the guy could be blowing smoke, but at least if you get him to have it, this guarantee saying, if this doesn't meet your expectations, well, then I or maybe even check off a box, write the question down and say, the gentleman said yes, the gentleman said no. And then have him sign a contract that says, if any of these aren't true, you can send it back, get all yep. your money back. Something like that. Something like that, if you can get it. Okay. I mean, it's the worst they can do is say no. Yep. And if, if then it, that's a whole nother decision tree. If they're not willing to do that, why aren't they? Exactly. That's a big red flag right <clears throat> yep, there. Yep. All right. Anything else before we sign off? No, here? I just I, I just love model seventies. That's yeah, all I can well, say. And of course, we don't have a bolt in it. We just took it out for safety reasons on the show, just so nobody freaked out and stuff. But uh, the bolts here, I've run it. It works. It just it doesn't necessarily close on around or pull it back out after you <laughs> shot it. Right. So hey guys, thanks for joining us. Um, let's all send some sympathy in for Steve with his little project here. <laughs> of course, he's got to do something with all this free time. <laughs> <laughs> but we really appreciate you. If you have any ideas on buying used firearms, if you've done it a lot and you've got some secret sauce that you could throw into the discussion here, man, we're always open to some of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. I have always been hesitant about buying rifles online. In fact, I've never done it. It's always been a personal thing where I see the gun and can check it out. And a lot of times I'll try to get a, the permission to go out and shoot it. And a lot of guys, when it's one-to-one -one like that, will let you do it. Yep. They might go with you, which is fine. Yep. Go out and shoot the thing. And then Absolutely. you really know. That's but, the difference between buying local and buying, as yeah. you say, four states away. But so. when you're looking for something special, that's not around every corner. Yep. You, you sometimes have to go. And, and online, there's some great sources to find things. Exactly. So don't, I wouldn't write it off. So we will continue this little project. And yep. until next time, we'll uh, see you all. We want to thank Steve for jumping in with his rifle here. Can't wait to shoot this thing, get it functioning, and see yep. how well it really I'm does. I'm excited. I really, I love shooting. So All right. We'll do there. it. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer with Steve. Hunt, honest, and shoot straight.